Hey Joe. Hey. Na 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 na. Do you want to have conversations with the Adventures in Angular crew and their guests? Do you want to support the show? Now you can. Go to adventuresinangular.com slash forum and sign up today. Hey everybody and welcome to episode 12 of the Adventures in Angular podcast. This week on our crew we have Joe Eames. Hey everybody. Lucas Rubelke. Hello. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv and this week we have a special guest, Federico Iacchetti. Hello from Argentina. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself really quickly, Federico? I'm Federico Iacchetti. I'm from Argentina. I work with with Chuck on the devchat.tv page. So um, I'm a Ruby developer, but I'm I have some work done on Angular. I'm a pretty newbie on Angular, so I'm here mostly to listen. <laughs> Federico, your accent is fantastic. If I wasn't already married. <laughs> thank you I was just thinking am I allowed to say something along those lines so thank you Joe for saying what I was thinking so I would like to say I'm actually here to listen to your accent for the next <laughs> one <laughs> thank you yeah and I, I really don't like my voice on on recording but thank you yeah, no, you are we probably going to get like 24 marriage proposals by uh, the time this episode is released just yes so. yes yeah but Joe was the first. He's a homewrecker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Joe, send me an email and we can talk about it. <laughs> awesome. I mean, I'm a married man. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, let's talk about directives. Do you guys have a good definition for what directives are or how people should think about them? They're the most complex part of Angular. <laughs> They're the hardest to define part of Angular. How about that? Yeah, not so, so hard. A few things. Directives are a way to essentially kind of encapsulate custom functionality into a new HTML tag or property or attribute. So, I mean, the entire premise of Angular is that you can extend HTML to do kind of new things. So Angular in itself is built on top of directives. So it's directives all the way down. But it allows you to either decorate an existing element or create kind of these portable components. But I think really the best definition for me and what I'm most excited about is directives are essentially a DSL for your HTML. Is that there's a big movement towards kind of semantic markup. Well, I think that ultimately directives allow you to, to really accomplish that by writing markup that really truly, if it's done properly in a good, you know, eye towards architecture, to really convey the the intent and the purpose of what that behavior for that HTML tag or attribute accomplishes. Yeah, it's it's interesting for everybody who's listened to the first episode when Mishko invented the first versions of Angular. His whole idea was a way for designers to go into HTML and specify things just in the HTML and basically build a working demo just by mucking around with the HTML. So directives are really what Angular started out with is I, directives were the core idea behind it all. And that, as Lucas said, that's making your HTML customizable with your own pieces, new pieces that you've built on your, on your own. So I've seen directives kind of work in two ways. I've seen the ones where you do like ng-if on an element and then it shows up if it's true and doesn't show up if it's false. And then I've also seen directives that look more like tags. So, you you know, you have like the, maybe an ng-video tag, for example. And then you would build out the functionality around that so that it gets rendered to a regular HTML tag of some kind. Maybe a video tag with some controls stuff in it. Do you have to think about those differently? The, so, like I said, is you can use directives to either decorate kind of an existing element, so that's like, for instance, ngf, which those commonly show up as like attributes, is that you're actually decorating whatever element that's on. So let's say you have a div tag with ngf, is you're saying when this is true, hide this, or uh, show this. So you're kind of augmenting the functionality of that div to be able to turn itself on or off. Whereas, so you would specify that 
in your directive is this is an attribute. And by default, that's uh, kind of what they default to. But with that said, is you will oftentimes, it's something that's kind of a self-contained component. Those generally will be like defined as element tags. So if I wanted to write a unicorn tag, I certainly could, and that would be kind of a self-contained unicorn component, if you will. Yeah, so there are there are a total of four ways to write directives, but two of them are not quite deprecated, but definitely not recommended and really only exist for support and compatibility with older browsers that have problems with custom tags and custom properties. You can write your directives using comments, you can write your directives using classes, and then you can write your directives using attributes and elements. And so the comments and the classes are really just to support older browsers. There are probably some other reasons that people could come up with to use them that way, but elements and properties are really the ways that we write directives today. Now, as Lucas mentioned that attributes is the default way, in Angular 1.3, that's changing. The default will be elements and attributes. If you write a directive and don't specify a default format, it will work in either. So that's something kind of interesting coming down the line. But I think that leads into another discussion on the purposes of Lucas. And Lucas talked about the two purposes, right? The first one is you're building some kind of a custom component. Like, again, unicorn. I think the canonical one is like a tile for that represents a user, right? I've got a tile that has the information about a user, and so I can just put on a user-tile tag somewhere on my page, and then the information about the user now shows up. And the other one that Lucas mentioned was decorators. If you want to decorate up some existing HTML with ng-if, with ng-hide or ng-show to display or hide the element, you can also decorate them with things like ng-controller. That's a way to decorate a tag and say, hey, I want a controller that controls this tag and all of its children and a scope that binds to it. There's a third purpose for directives that is way less thought about, and that are structural directives. For example, the ng-repeat, ng-switch, to actually a lesser extent, ng-if is this way too. But these tags structurally modify your HTML, your DOM, and set up something. And ng-repeat is a really just a really good example to think of that. You throw an ng repeat down, and all of a sudden it explodes out into this, into a whole bunch of repeating divs or whatever it is that you're going to be putting down and styling up your inner content with. So there's really kind of three purposes to directives. And we think about them when we build custom directives mostly for the first two components, and then secondly for decorating something and giving a, an existing tag some new functionality with the decorator. And what's interesting is in Angular 2.0, supposedly, this will actually be represented in the language or in the framework. So when you build a directive, you will actually be building either a decorator directive or a structural directive, or you'll be building a what they call they call a component directive, the sort of widget user tile type thing. But supposedly somehow, and I don't know, I haven't seen this, how this will work, but you'll actually be building three different things. So I don't know, maybe there won't be a directive anymore, there'll be a component, decorator, and a, a structural or, or templater. I've heard that term thrown around as well by the Angular team. Yeah, it seems like there are very types and stages or levels of complicatedness, I guess. There, I just made up a word. So I'm wondering what type of directive is the easiest to get started with, and then how do you kind of grow from there to get to the more complicated types? Oh, by far so, the easiest is the component, right? Yeah, you know, a widget. But I would say when you when you're approaching directives, is admittedly with you know like isolated scope and transclusion and the different kind of the depths that you can take it, is if you really kind of step back, there is kind of a simplified worldview that I like to use when thinking about directives. In that is, there's really kind of three main components that you'll build everything else off of. And that is your directive definition object, which I lovingly refer to as the DDO the link function, and the controller function. And a lot of times you can actually build a directive that's entirely capable and appropriate just using your DDO, saying, when I have this attribute or this element, I just want to drop in this template, and I want it to maybe behave this way, like replace the HTML, etc. And so from the DDO, and once you understand that that's just the configuration object for your directive, 
then you can dig into the link function, which allows you to actually do DOM manipulation on the element that you declared your directive on. And then the controller is actually pretty easy because it works just like the controller in an Angular application. And so kind of in a way, the directives are kind of a microcosm of an Angular JS application unto itself. Exactly. But that is really, I think, when you understand, like, hey, like, yeah, there's these complex things, but once I understand the DDO and the link function and that a controller is just a controller, I think people kind of kind of take a deep breath and realize, like, oh, this is really just a composition of ideas and techniques that I'm already familiar with, and it's not that bad. Right. So let me see if I can restate some of this. So what you're saying is that if you think about it in these three parts, in your DDO is kind of the setup for your directive. You know, yep. it tells it what it is and what to look for. And then your link function, I asked you this before the show, is essentially your jQuery object or, you know, whatever reference you have to the DOM that allows you to manipulate it. And then the controller is what gives it the behavior that you want it to have once you have everything else set up. Am I misstating anything there? I don't I would not ding you for that. So, I mean, I think that was a pretty reasonable explanation. Obviously, we could elaborate on that further, but, I mean, that's right. Is you know, the link function is one of the parameters is element, and the element is a jQuery object that you can perform DOM manipulation on, and then the controllers where you would obviously want to put kind of like your logic in for that directive, then your directive... Event handlers and things like that. Exactly. So, and then your DDO is just to, to set it up. It's just a, essentially a JavaScript object. So one other thing that I'm wondering about then, you've mentioned templates a few times. The templates, when would you use a directive and when would you use maybe a template with a controller that just gives it behavior? Like you're talking about like an ng include, right? Yeah. You know, it's actually a good point. A lot of people, when they come into Angular, will either start embracing directives and use that entirely, or they'll start embracing ng controller and ng include, and then use that entirely to break down their page into smaller pieces. And of course, some people will just, and this is of course really sad, but you'll end up with a 500 line controller, you've got a single controller for everything, and you don't break down your page into smaller pieces at all. So once you do start breaking it down, you do have those options. You can either break it down using directives, you can break it down using ng include paired up with ng controller. And I think it comes down to portability. Sorry, Joe, I didn't mean to interrupt no, you. But not at all. I think with ng include, like if I was doing like just a header and a footer and a page, and it wasn't going to change, um, and I never needed to use it again, I might just take the path of least resistance and use ng include. But the minute that I need to actually use it, that functionality in more than one place, then using ng include, you really lose that portability. And so pulling that, abstracting that out into a directive allows you to use it over and over and over, which is a huge advantage, in my opinion. Well, there's also what you mentioned before, which is the declarative nature of what Angular is and self-describing HTML. Sure, you can put your footer in an include, but if you have an element called footer on your page, now, of course, that's actually an HTML5 element. I was so. going to say, but keep, keep going. <laughs> that's a good copy. example. Right, they're, they're copying Angular, dang it. But, you know, maybe a slightly more business-specific name to what you would have for your footer, and you have this element down there, and now it's self-describing. So it can be a little bit more complex to put it in a directive, because now you have a few more moving pieces than if you just do an ng-include and an ng-controller. But you also have to decide with ng-controller and ng-include, do you put the controller on the outside and then the include on the inside, or do you just put the include, and then inside the template you specify what the controller is, and therefore when you look at it you see the include, but you don't know which controller that uses until you dig into the template that that include is including. So there's some more moving pieces with using the directive method, but using the include method also kind of hides some intent, where directives might actually expose that intent by naming something really appropriately. And also then putting on really appropriate properties that indicate what's going on. You know? Like you can have properties that kind of describe the state of the object, at least how it is initially. And so when a developer comes through and sees this directive, you also see a set of properties that kind of describe how that directive is set up initially and what's, what is going on and what its purposes are and sort of customization parameters. Yeah, one other thing that occurs to me as well is that if you have a set of functionality that all kind of go together, for example, you know, you have the controller that controls a certain part of the page 
and you have enough of that stuff that pulls it together in your link function, then putting it into a directive kind of communicates not only the intent, like Joe said, but it also communicates this is sort of one thing. This is one widget, one collection of behavior from sort of front to back within the Angular app. Right. And so you get this nice encapsulation of a set of functionality. Right. And I want to go back to something that Lucas said about the self-describing HTML. I had a conversation with John Lindquist at one point, and he said when he, he goes in on to do any consulting with people on Angular, he says one of the things I can use to tell whether or not they know what they're doing in Angular is just by looking at the HTML. I never have to look at the code. I can simply just look at their HTML. And by looking at that and seeing their use of directives, that tells me how well they understand Angular and how well they're using it. And I thought that was a really interesting statement. That is really interesting. I think another pretty, this is kind of a little bit topic switching, but another pretty interesting thing about directives is, I think when you first start out with Angular, and I remember this for me, I assume most people maybe have gone through this stage, you start working with Angular, and all you know is you're throwing these little attributes into your page to make Angular work, and you're not thinking about the fact that those are directives, then you learn how to do directives, and what you're doing is you're building these element-based directives with these widgets and components. And then at some point, it finally clicks that, oh my gosh, all these things that are on the page that makes Angular work, these are actually just directives. They're no different than a directive that I create. And that's when the lights come on, I think, for Mm -hmm. me. Anytime I've talked about directives, is you start to build on these concepts, and then you can really tell when they get it, because it's like, oh, well, that's what Angular's doing in the first place, is they're using Angular to build Angular. And so they kind of make that connection, that full loop. Right. And it's really, really cool because I think then it's like I could do anything with Angular. And, you know, it really kind of opens and broadens the horizons that really your HTML is, if it can be done in JavaScript and, you know, given browser limitations, is you can really push the envelope really, really far using directives, which is just amazing. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things you start realizing you could do is if I'm creating, again, some kind of component, you know, a user tile, again, component, a directive, then I realize pretty quickly that that doesn't have to be this big, huge, monolithic piece. I can start using attribute-based directives, so decorators, to break down the functionality, pull functionality outside of that. And some of that might be reusable. And some of those sub-directives might not be reusable because they're very business-specific to the user, but it's a way to componentize a bigger directive into smaller pieces that can be dealt with on their own and thought about on their own. And you start to see the ability to take pieces of Angular and put them into directives. And I think that's the flow of how people learn to use directives. They start learning to use directives by building a big component, you know, some kind of a widget. And then at a certain point, they start thinking, well, I'm going to break this down into smaller pieces. And maybe they do smaller component directives within the bigger one. So if I've got my user tile, then maybe I have an address component to it, and maybe I've got a rights or permissions sub-directive to that, but then pretty soon they start seeing opportunities to put in decorators, so on the user I can put in just an attribute that then gives that user new capabilities, like the ability to switch states from being an enabled user to a disabled user just by adding on a directive that's an attribute on the user element rather than actually hard-coding that right into the user. Uh, so it's a very interesting process. I have to wonder, if you've read refactoring books, they talk a bit about code smells. And so are there code smells that tend to indicate to you that you need to take a certain set of functionality and turn it into a directive? Are you repeating yourself? I think that's a, a really good one. Is Are you doing something in more than one place? That It's probably a good candidate for uh, turning it into a directive. And then also, you know, kind of the big angular thing is, you know, do not do DOM manipulation in your controller. And so anytime that I'm tempted to do that, it's just like, oh, I need to turn this into a directive. And so that's another big one because that is ultimately where DOM manipulation happens is, is in the directive. Those are kind of my two big ones, but Joe, I'd love to hear your ideas. Well, I'm sure you've done this as well, Lucas. You go through your angular application, all of a sudden you're seeing a piece and you're thinking, I wish that piece was a smaller piece. And that you not wouldn't necessarily, I think it goes back to that declarative intent. You're not necessarily going to reuse that piece somewhere else. But you think, oh, if I collapsed all of this into one widget, then all of a sudden I've got an easy declarative piece to my application that's telling me what's going on. In one of my Pluralsight courses, 
I talk about this concept of breaking down a page into smaller pieces, and I show taking a big chunk of HTML that's 120 lines long and pulling out pieces and replacing them with a directive to just describe. So one of them was like the menu system. I pull out all the HTML for the menu and just put in a menu directive. And then in the body, I pull out a bunch of pieces, some ng repeats, and put in a user list directive. And then within that, there's a user directive, and so on and so forth. So that declarative idea of taking... And I think this comes potentially from just looking at your HTML and studying it and saying, where are the pieces that should be broken out into their own encapsulated box? So I think that's a third way to indicate when it's time to build a directive. And obviously there's a point where you're building something and you're like, oh, I should be doing a directive here. And just right from the beginning, you think this should be a directive. Well said. You're talking about when to create directives. I want to ask a question about tricks or tips to create directives that you can use all over the place. Is there a good, a good way to, to create a, a small directive that you can use all over the place, you can nest it, and I, I don't know if I'm clear on the... No, I got so. it. <clears throat> Makes sense. What do you think, Lucas? I would say if you are trying to promote reusability, so especially within a company, really take the time to understand isolated scope. And, you know, in that sense, isolated scope, what it does is it kind of puts a fence around your directive and allows you to define how the outside world can interact with your directive. And when you do that, essentially you are creating an API for that directive. So you might say, I'm going to isolate scope so that only this property on scope can communicate with the outside world. And so using like binding isolated scope, you might have, say, for instance, let's say you have a user directive and you say, I'm going to pass in this user object and then that's what I'm going to bind on, is that that prevents the outside world from creating unintended side effects into your directive and vice versa. And so that would be, like, my number one tip is if you're building something that's going to be passed around and you are not sure of how people are going to be using it, there's kind of, like, use this however you want, there's infinite permutations, is really take the time to lock that down with isolated scope. And the side effect is that it does provide kind of a clear API of what your directive does and what it does not and how to communicate with it. Yeah, awesome. I'll chime in with uh, my own advice, and that would be to think about separation of concerns. So even within a directive, even though directives are kind of the, we think of that as, oh, I need to manipulate the DOM, I need to build a directive. But even within directives, you can have certain pieces where, oh, here... I'm doing some manipulation to the display. And over here, I'm doing some business logic manipulation and thinking about the fact that oh, these are actually kind of two, sep two different concerns and I'm putting them within the same directive. So if I pull out the piece that manipulates the display into its own subdirective, then I might be able to reuse that in multiple places. And of course, if you also consider, oh, there's some business logic tied into something that you know maybe switches highlight levels and goes from like a blank to a yellow to a red and back and forth, but there's business logic, you can probably work and pull the business logic out and now be able to reuse that component in multiple places. So that's another way to think to get more reusable components. But really, it's just a matter of the smaller the directive is, the more likely it is to be reusable or the more to kind of go the opposite direction. If you're doing something very business specific, the more comprehensive it is that also makes it reusable, right? Because a user widget that works in one place might not, might not work in another unless you add more capabilities to kind of change its representation, but then be able to reuse it in multiple places. So I have one final question uh, before we get to the picks, and that is, in Joe's example with the user list, would that be a directive that just wraps around an ng-include directive? Yeah, I would say that one is probably not wrapping around an ng-include. It's probably producing HTML that inside of it just says, all right, now here's a user directive and, I'm give, I, and I'll am feed that user directive its particular user. So it takes in a list of users and it creates a, a repeating list of user directives, each one having its own user information. And this is a pretty simplistic case. It's hard to talk about by voice, but in that case, you really could just replace it with an ng repeat. But there are certainly more opportunities to have business-specific repeating lists where ng repeat doesn't quite cut it. But for me, that would be structurally I'm creating a whole bunch of user objects or user directives rather than a bunch of ng-includes. Okay, that makes sense. All right, well, let's go ahead and do the 
the picks. Joe, do you want to start us off? You bet. We only get one pick. And since we've been talking about this today, it's pretty early. It'll be quite a bit of time. But I'm mean, right in the middle of authoring a course on directives for Pluralsight.com. And it's a pretty Hooray. deep dive. Yeah. It's a pretty deep dive. The first few modules kind of start from ground zero, where you may have not have ever built a directive. But then I go, I do get really deep into like how to recreate ng repeat and how to do your own custom repeating directives, how to do transclusion correctly and all the different variations on that, how to work effectively with services and cover directives really comprehensively. And that should, that should be out in around a month. So sometime around the 1st of November, maybe a little bit after that. So that'll be my pick. Awesome. Do you have a tip? Yeah, keep your eyes out on Angular 1.3 because there's a lot of cool things coming up in it and they're changing a few, a few things. So if you get time, go and read the release notes for Angular 1.3 and I'll put them in the show notes. All right, Lucas, do you have a pick and a tip for us? So I think one of my favorite programming books is Clean Code by Robert C. Martin, a.k.a. Uncle Bob. And actually, oh my gosh, I love you for saying that, Lucas. Yes, I mean, it, it's literally when I read it, it just kind of crystallized everything I wanted to be as, um, as a craftsman, and I use that word very specifically, and if you've read that book, you'll understand why, is I just try to pick it up every so often and just kind of go through it. I think it's really one of the most important programming books that I know of that I've ever read. So Clean Code by Robert C. Martin. If you haven't read it, go read it. If you have read it, read it again. And uh, two tips around directives is one is when you declare your directive, it'll be in camel case, but when you actually embed it into your HTML or declare it, Angular automatically converts that into snake case. And so, for instance, if you did like my capital D directive, when you declare it in your HTML, it would be my hyphen directive. And so I've been uh, bit by that a few times. So camel case gets converted into snake case. And one more kind of best practice is in a link function, you do get a scope object. I really recommend to not put your imperative logic in the link function, but actually separate that back out into the controller because the controller and the link function share the same scope object, but really try to keep that in the controller. It just makes it easier to test. Those are awesome pieces of advice, Lucas. Awesome. That's the case thing. Still bites me to this day sometimes. So easy to forget. Yep. Very cool. My pick, my iPhone had some battery problems. And there's a, there's a store out here, I guess they're uh, spread far and wide, called Simply Mac. And uh, I took my iPhone in there, told them I was having the battery problems. It turns out there was a recall on the iPhone 5. So if your battery lasts not as long as it should, then uh, you know you can go check and see if it's eligible for battery replacement. So I had... My battery replaced for free, and it made me very happy. So I'm going to pick that. And then I'm just going to plug, I have a lot of people asking me about podcasting. So uh, if you go to pickuppodcasting.com, you can actually get my podcaster's tools guide and get signed up for a webinar that I'm going to be doing uh, later this month. So check that out. And I don't have an Angular tip. So Federico, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, I have two picks. The first one is a shameless self-promotion. <laughs> I'm working on a project called T-Rex, which is my... I'm making it my engineering thesis. And the idea is to make screencasts, instead of using video as the backend, use just text. It's implemented in Ruby, and I'm right now working on a JavaScript client. So I'll put my the link on the show notes. And... My other big is concept is pair programming. I really love to pair program with whoever I can. So I think it's a very, very, very good practice. So if any of you or our listeners can or want to pair with me on anything, I'm open to it. So those are my two picks. I don't have a, a tip because as I said, I'm a, a newbie. But I like to use this space to tell something that I'm that really changed my view on Angular. Today we talked about uh, directives, and I don't know who of you said anything you can do in Angular uh, is a is a directive or something like that. And something that 
really changed my view of Angular is ng app is a directive. So yeah, Angular is built on Angular. So I, I know it's not a tip, but something that can make you see it differently. And um, that's it. Well said. Thanks. I mean, that is kind of the big punchline with Angular. Said like, hey, it's built on top of it. Yeah, yeah. that's really cool. I never really thought of it that way. Yeah. Yeah, right. someone told, told me that and blew my mind, so. <laughs> <laughs> Can you say that one more time? Way. Say, blew my mind. That was, I love that. <laughs> Come on. So, blew my mind. Yes. <laughs> you're, making, you're making me blush. <laughs> <laughs> you know the, the red button to hang the, the call out? Well, that's me now, right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. We'll catch you all next week. This episode is sponsored by Mad Glory. You've been building software for a long time, and sometimes it gets a little overwhelming. Work piles up, hiring sucks, and it's hard to get projects out the door. Check out Mad Glory. They're a small shop with experience shipping big products. They're smart, dedicated, will augment your team, and work as hard as you do. Find them online at madglory.com or on Twitter at madglory. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.